First of all, what is a missile? A uh, missile, as most of you probably know, is a large, ornate book. We have some samples here. A book containing all the texts required to celebrate the Mass every day of the year, not just Sundays. Originally, these texts were printed in several, or not printed, handwritten in several different books. The prayers were written in the sacramentary, the readings in the lectionary, and the gradual contained the intervenient chants. But about a thousand years ago, these books first were put together into one large book to rule them all, so to speak, a missal or a mass book. And before long, within a couple centuries, missals were used universally in every diocese of the Catholic Church. At the time of the Reformation, the reformers inherited the missals and continued to use them and then gradually began to revise them, correcting uh, chiefly the collects and uh, the canon of the Mass. And then over the next 150 years, the Lutherans continued to use and produce their own missiles in German, sometimes in a combination of German and Latin. But an odd thing happened. When Lutherans came to the United States, we left the missiles behind. And as we began to speak English, we never got around to producing an English missile. So nearly 200 years later, we have missile stands on every one of our altars, but no missiles. Perhaps you have a three-ring binder. Maybe you have a uh, large book that has all of the things that you don't need to conduct the Mass, but nothing that you need to conduct a single service from beginning to end. I believe that Zion may be the only exception to this, um, having a missile that, has, that uh, has been part of your history and that you've worked on to produce. But a single missile for the Lutheran Church, we have not had one in at least 200 years. So, for example, what are the propers for St. Lawrence, universally commemorated by the church on August 10th? It's anyone's guess. Some of you may know how to find these types of resources, but you have to pull them in from all over the place. What are the historic rites for the proper commemoration of Good Friday? Well, as this picture would suggest, every pastor simply does what is right in his own eyes. As I said, in those days, there was no missile in the land. Yes. So about a dozen years ago, Father Heath Curtis made a solid first effort to produce a Lutheran missile. Many of you may have this book on your shelves. I first learned of it when I was tasked with preaching for the Feast of St. Ambrose as a field worker at Redeemer, and I had no idea what the propers ought to be. This book, at least for the first time, could answer that question, but as Heath Curtis would be the first to admit, it, uh, it drew mostly from Roman Catholic sources from the 1960s, these sorts of, of small hand missiles that the Roman church has continued to produce and use. A few, uh, a few years ago, Heath asked me to edit the second edition of his book, and initially the plan was simply clean up the typos, uh, lay out the book in a, in a better, more easy to uh, understand and read format. But as we began the work, it soon became clear both to Heath and to myself that what the church needed was not a second edition of this book, but a true Lutheran missal, diligently drawn not from a handful of Roman sources, but from the most ancient manuscripts of the Western church, the late medieval missiles that the reformers inherited and continued to use, and of course the post-reformational Lutheran sources. And so the Lutheran Missal, as our project will be called when completed, was born. Now a word about the historic lectionary. Some of you may have heard, uh, you may have heard people say that there is actually no such thing as the historic lectionary. Have you heard that? that um, everybody did whatever they wanted a thousand years ago, as many pastors do today. Uh, but this we have found in our research to be utterly untrue. Now granted, every diocese, if you were to pick any random missile produced any time in the last 1500 years, 
it would contain a certain degree of local oddities, we might say. But there was also a large body of, tra of tradition that was common to the entire Western church. The trick is when you open one source to decide or to discover, is this a local oddity or is this part of our common heritage? A quote from Article 24 of our confessions. We also keep the traditional liturgical forms such as the order of readings and prayers. We confess this, we subscribe to it, then I could ask, then where are they? Where are the traditional readings and prayers that you have subscribed with a solemn vow to follow? Good question. They have never been published, so to speak, as the traditional prayers of the church. They have been included in resources with other new traditions, but never published as a single work. So if we were to discover these, uncover them, where would we start? Well, for example, what if we started with a single missal from the Diocese of Halberstadt? This was published in 1511, and if you were to celebrate the Mass on Wednesday of Populus Zion, Advent 2, this missal says that you would use Mark chapter 1. Is this the Halberstadt practice only, or does this reflect the common tradition of the church? We don't know. Let's take a step back and look at the neighboring dioceses. And now we have a problem. Uh, one does Matthew, one does Mark, and one does Luke. This seems to strengthen the argument that everybody simply did whatever they wanted. But what if we did something that has never been done in the history of the Western church? What if we took a step back, not 100 feet up, but 30,000 feet up? What if we looked at 50 dioceses at the same time? This would not even have been possible 10 years ago because these were uh, not yet available online as they now are. And now look what we see. There are 51 sources for Matthew 11, one for Luke and two for Mark. Is there a clear historic consensus, a real historic tradition that belongs to Western Christendom? Yes, indeed there is. But it's going to take some serious effort to uncover this because if we just chose one missile at random, we would not know that we were following the historic practice of the church. We would to some degree, but we would also have maybe 10% of local customs mixed in. And so we began our work of collecting these 50 sources and indexing the contents of these. And Steph, uh, Father Stefan is going to talk about the sources themselves. We have this quotation from the Reverend Arthur Carl Peepcorn, who you've heard a little bit about so far, and in fact, from his 1952 book, What the Luth Symbols of the Lutheran Church Have to Say on Worship in the Sacraments. He says, the basis of the reformers' liturgical rites and ceremonies is the medieval Western rite as the church in Northern Europe observed it at the beginning of the 16th century. And then he added that we didn't put it on the slide. Unlike the Anglican reformers, the Lutheran reformers are not concerned about conforming their right either to the Eastern or to the primitive church. So we're not interested in dusting off 1500 years of history, trying to get back to the beginning and uh, uncover a Eucharistic prayer from say, pseudo Hippolytus. Anyway, so, we come to our actual sources. We started out with 35 dioceses, roughly corresponding to the area of modern Germany. It's a bit arbitrary, to be fair, but we needed somewhere to start. Um, after working through the lections and finding some complications along the way, um, Germany is a, a very flexible concept, as it were, over the course of history. And so uh, we broadened our look at the, uh, to what more or less covers the area of influence of the Holy Roman Empire. Uh, we wind up with 13 more dioceses uh, in that way. Uh, then just for good measure, we threw in some extra German influence territories in the Baltics and Scandinavia, specifically the archdioceses of Scandinavia because we 
found that we had a little too much on our hands, maybe. And so that brings us to another seven missiles. And then, you know, just for kicks, we threw in the English use of serum, as well as the uh, Liber Usualis of 1961. So what your um, traditional Latin mass friends and family would be using for the sake of reference, though we have to admit we don't put any weight whatsoever on them. And so at the end of the day, we've wound up with 56 total dioceses and the Liber Usualis. In addition to that, we have the four most ancient uh, extant Western lectionaries, those, uh, the one ascribed to Jerome, that of Würzburg, um, circa 700 or earlier, Murbach, circa 800 or earlier, and I missed one. Oh, Alcuin, um, in the Carolingian Renaissance, uh, who does his rectionary, lectionary reforms. All right, so you may be asking, oh, and we also have our Lutheran sources, which is where I'm going next anyway. Uh, so you can see we have quite a lot of medieval sources and not all that many Lutheran sources. You might ask yourself, what in the world are we doing with all these medieval sources in a Lutheran missal? Well, while medieval missals are generally consistent in their order and in their arrangement, our Lutheran sources are, you might say, more eclectic. So take, for example, the um, beautiful Magdeburg Cathedral book of 1630 used in the Lutheran Cathedral of Magdeburg, the seat of the Archbishop of Magdeburg, for many years, one of the primates of Germany. And as you can see, there's a lot going on. So if you look on the left, this is strange, there's no mass here. All right, so we have uh, Matins and Vespers and then we get to Sunday and we also have Matins. And only after that does Mass actually show up. So Magdeburg is going to give you the first two words of the reading and the last three words of the reading and assume you already know where to find it. It's very comprehensive, if a little eccentric. Ludacus, um, perhaps one of our more preferred sources, is a rather more traditional noted missile format. So as you can see, we have our intro it for Ash Wednesday here on the left. Then we have our collect, also the note not to sing the glory in excelsis after the curiae, and then the reading from the prophet Joel. Easy enough. Onward, we have uh, the Missal Germanicum, which is the first volume of a uh, contemplated work that doesn't seem to have been completed. It provides complete mass and office propers, but in German. So you can see here, they lay out exactly what to do at the morning minor offices, at the procession, then finally at the Mass. So we have all of these various Lutheran sources and another dozen actually that we have yet to actually thoroughly index and catalog. But the question is, of course, with Lutheran sources like these, why use medieval sources at all? Well, our approach to the Lutheran Missal is in many ways the same approach as that of the framers of the Common Service of 1888. Namely, that we use the Lutheran liturgies of the 16th century, which were not new and original works created by the reformers, but were chiefly revisions of the service of the, of the Latin church. There are some more choice words from Dr. Peepcorn. Um, where the historic Lutheran rite has been retained or restored, it generally reveals a purer and older form of the Western rite than the reformed Roman Catholic rite of today exhibits. This is significant. So for example, we discovered in the process of our research that there is in fact such a thing as a weekday lectionary. And if you were to look at a map of Europe, what you were supposed to read on the Wednesday of Advent 2 of all of Europe, you would see that pretty much everyone had Matthew 11 with a few exceptions. Some people had nothing at all. Those people included the Diocese of Rome. So Rome had no weekday lectionaries, and in the promulgation of the 1570 Missal after the Council of Trent, whenever the entire Roman, when the Roman use was enforced on the entire Western Church, in effect, two-thirds of the Church's lectionary was obliterated. And so relying on Roman sources will rob you of two-thirds of the Church's temporal lectionary. It's almost like you need to invent a three-year. Yeah, it's almost like you need to invent something to replace it then. Anyway, and so it gives us a denominationally and confessionally distinctive right to which we have historic title and which we have not lately borrowed from alien sources. It gives us a right which is an invaluable symbol of the antiquity, the historic continuity, 
and the thorough Catholicity of the Church of the Augsburg Confession. At the same time, it gives us a right which is both older than and significantly and recognizably different from the present Roman Catholic right. When considered apart from their medieval precedents, the Lutheran liturgical books are unfortunately very prone to being profoundly misunderstood or simply incomprehensible. Most Lutheran sources assume that you already know what to do. They're just sort of giving you prompts along the way so that you do the right thing. So in the Halberstadt Cathedral of um, the Halberstadt Cathedral use of 1591, the entire book is in effect an index to how you should use the medieval book that you have already on your altar. And so in the Vigil of the, the Nativity, it says Vespers and Compline, as in the breviary. Matins, the invitator invitatorius Christus Natus est nobis, the antiphons, the three nocturnes, the lections, the homilies, the, the responsories, the Te Deum, lauds, all is in the breviary, and so on. Here we have uh, Magdeburg 1613, one of our more thorough Lutheran uses. And as you can see up here, we have a reading ascribed, um, assigned for the octave of the epiphany of our Lord. So January 13th, the baptism of our Lord in today's parlance. And what is the reading? A reading from Isaiah, the prophet, chapters 12 and 25 and smudges somewhere in the middle. This would be pretty much indecipherable if we hadn't already cataloged the Magdeburg Missal of 1503 that preceded the Reformation. As a result, we know that this is a highly eclectic but also universally attested both among Lutherans and among medieval sources compilation reading from Isaiah, the reference for which you can see up there. It took a bit of doing um, on the part of the person who went through and deciphered where exactly it was all from. Uh, again, in this same vein, the cathedral use of Brandenburg in 1645 is only about 30 pages long. 30 pages for the cathedral. And do you know what it is? It is once again a list of page numbers telling you exactly where to find everything in the other book. All right. Perhaps most blatantly is the Missal of Ludacus, usually complete in just about every respect until you get to Lent. And then you look at what he has to say. Additionally, the peculiar offices, collects, lessons, epistles, tracts, and gospels on each ferial day throughout Lent, because you have Mass every day from Ash Wednesday through the octave of Easter, were hardly assigned without wisdom or good order by the godly doctors of the early church, all of which, lest the book to grow too large, have been purposefully omitted, and those only that fall on Sundays have been included. But whoso will to read the others, let him seek elsewhere. So... In other words, I didn't have enough room, but you know, you know where to find them. All right. Okay. I'd like to give you a look at our process. We began three years ago with data entry. And this is an example of what it would look like. We have a PDF scan of a missile. This is Ad Te Lavave. And we need to convert this into a searchable format like this that could be helpful to us. So our team of about a dozen volunteers would go through line by line, entering the first few Latin words of every element of the Mass, the introit, the introit verse, and the Gloria in excelsis, along with the rubric that says, omit the Gloria all through Advent until Christmas Day, unless there is a Feast of the Saints. Some of the manuscripts are handwritten, and uh, some of these are rather difficult to read. This is the Wurzburg from around 650, most likely. Some are absolutely gorgeous works of art, all hand-drawn. And others are uh, so poorly scanned to make them nearly impossible to read, except when the other missiles tell you what it ought to say, you can see that, yes, it, they do agree. All of the missiles use this odd and eclectic form of abbreviation that is never documented, you're simply expected to know from the priest who knew before, who learned it from the priest before. So, for example, this says that the gospel for St. Agnes is simile est regnum caelorum decem virginibus, the parable of the ten virgins, which, as every priest would have known, there are only two options for the feast of a holy woman, either the ten virgins or the treasure hidden in a field. 
And so, later in the missal, it's simply given like this. And the letter X apparently is sufficient to let the priest know to read the ten virgins and not the treasure. All of this has to be sort of puzzled out as you go. Uh, here is a mass, most of a mass for Henry II. Uh, second, we have a collect for Cunegundus, and then the prayer omnipotence, which you find above. The epistle is written in the common of the martyrs. The gospel, you should know where it is. We're not even going to tell you. There are about 5,000 propers in a single missal. Multiply that by 50, you end up with a quarter million propers that our team of volunteers spent two or three years entering. And why? So that when all of this work was done, we could have that view from 30,000 feet. What is the historic practice of the church? But even yet, uh, once this data collection was done, it was not yet usable. Here are the introits, or the, uh, the first few Latin words, the incipits, recorded from a bunch of different sources. There's variations in spelling, variations in word order, word substitution, higher levels of abbreviation. There's no way to perform one search. So we had to painstakingly go through every one of these texts and line it up with a specific pericope. There were 40,000 lections. Every lection pictured here is actually the same pericope. The same thing was true for the intervenient chants as well as the uh, 72,000 collects. Here you'll see a, a bunch of collects for mostly for St. Mark, appearing to be all different collects, beginning with different words, ending with different words, but actually the same collect, every one of them. This process is almost complete. It has taken about a year. And finally, last Advent, we could begin phase three, which is actually editing our missile. And it's not as though we're making decisions uh, and, and deciding a missile. It is more like we are confirming the historic practice of the church. So we uh, began meeting via Zoom, about eight or nine of us. There's four editors in the room here, I believe, today. And we could finally have a list of everything that was done on any day that we asked for. But the software could do better than that. It could represent this list visually, which allows us to make a much better um, quick assessment of what's going on. This might look a little scattered. And granted, a Friday, a minor day in the week, can tend to fragment a bit. But even here, 31 sources clearly uh, list John 1, whereas the next runner-up has only five, or five that attest. But when we go to Sundays, we find nearly universal attestation all the way back from as early as the 400s, and beyond that we simply don't have records, it's not that the church invented it in that year, all the way through the medieval, late medieval tradition, the Lutherans, even up to the present day, this is uh, Sunday, the epistle for sexagesima. And finally, uh, one challenge that I would like to, oh yeah, begs the question, who would dare to throw this out? 1,600 years of history to invent something out of thin air last week. Actually, it's not his fault. He did not do this. One final example. Uh, a beautiful little puzzle that we encountered early on where there appeared to be two different traditions for the epistle reading for Friday of the first week of Advent. You can see a majority tradition in the south and a minority tradition in the north. Now, we're not simply in the business of counting noses. We also pay attention to the, the quality of the sources or the weight that particular sources have. The northeast of Germany certainly means a lot to us because this is the birthplace of the Reformation. But in this case, uh, what won the day was the pairing between the gospel and the epistle. The gospel is Luke 3. The people come to John, what should we do? He says to the people, the tax collectors, the soldiers, it reads like a table of duties. And the minority tradition suggested Zechariah 9, 
which is quoted in Sunday's Gospel, Rejoice, Daughter of Zion, certainly appropriate in the first week of Advent. But the majority tradition gives St. Paul's table of duties from Titus 2. It's, a be- it's almost as if our fathers in the faith knew what they were doing. It's too early to say, um, because the lectionary is not complete yet, but at, current, at the current state, it covers um, 15% more of the Gospels than the three-year lectionary. And when it is done, it is likely, if we take parallel readings into account, that it will um, achieve 99% coverage of every verse in the Gospels. And this is what our fathers already had before we thought to tinker with it. Uh, A few final words from Father Stefan. All right, hopefully a very few final words. Uh, Let me see. So at some point, uh, let me see. All right, so the translation at this point, elections are expected to be in the New King James Version. Um, Let me see the the service, the intervenient chants in the King James. Um, There is some precedent for this. If you've seen in our examples, the Lutheran sources sort of switch back and forth between Latin and German. It was not at all uncommon to find your Latin um, intro at gradual sequence alongside a German epistle and gospel. Even going back further than this, in the medieval use, usually the portions of the Psalter that were used in the service were taken from the Vetus Latina text, the old Latin Psalter, and not from the Vulgate. And so there's actually quite an old history in the church of retaining that older language for the Psalter and having a slightly newer version for the lections. One of the questions we get a lot um, that usually is pretty easy to answer is what does the service itself look like? Well, it, it looks like TLH page 15 or LSB setting three. It's as easy as that. The only ch- possible changes would be the options for proper offertories, communions, post-communion collects, and so on. Um, in terms of the final product, there will not only be a missile. These examples are from the publisher that we've signed a contract with, who does a great amount of publishing for um, various Catholic purposes in this country, headquartered in New Jersey. Uh, Missal, altar edition, desk edition, slash chapel edition, and a personal edition, like your hand missile, that um, your grandmother may have grown up with if she grew up a Roman Catholic. In addition, a gospel book, an epistolary, um, so that your deacons and subdeacons have something to hold whenever they're instituted. And, uh, and of course, and of course, a gradual and sequencer. In addition, we hope to have online supplementary materials available, such as bulletin inserts with readings and propers to make it as easy as humanly possible for you to use these at historic lectionary. Uh, in terms of field testing, you should have a sheet in front of you, perhaps, um, that provides you a place to fill in your email address so that you can provide that to us. We will send out the entire temporal lectionary to you, as well as weekly updates with summaries of readings and um, We want to hear your feedback. What do you think? Do you like the Old Testament selections? Do you like LSB better? Should we go with TLH? Something else? Let us know. Anything else? Blue Dacus Press. Oh, yes. Um, We have uh, incorporated a publishing house quite recently on the Feast of St. Lawrence, apparently. Um, So that's kind of cool. Maybe we should have named it St. Lawrence Press. You know, hindsight 2020, all that. In the spirit of uh, Matthias Ludacus, the compiler of the Havelberg Missal, Uh, for the cathedral there where he was the dean who provided that lovely rubric for Lent that said, whatever you need to know for these daily masses in Lent, you know where to look. He's our great inspiration for this. So any other comments? All right, thank you very much.